Hello. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I apologize for not having enough seats in the, in the room. That is my fault. I totally apologize. But welcome. This, this, the good news is that this will be a very, very quick uh, briefing, like 59 minutes, and then we're out of here. So um, it's going to be a fast-paced topic. Uh, just, just hang with us. Um, the, the, the title of the panel is called Data Across Borders, Treaties, Law Enforcement, Digital Privacy in the Aftermath of Snowden. It sounds like a mouthful, but they're going to break it down in more digestible parts. Um, this is like in a series of events that we've been doing in the wake of the Snowden revelations on issues ranging from ECBA reform, which was last year. Um, more recently this year, we had one on um, encryption uh, in, in surveillance and that, that issue. All of these events that we've done are usually in video on our website or through audio podcasts, which you can also find on our website. This one will be is live on Periscope today, as well as will be podcast within like um, 30 minutes of the event. You can follow uh, the conversation. The hashtag for today is called is is hashtag data privacy. Um, our um, our information, our Twitter information, is on this sheet, as is the Twitter information for all the panelists. If you want to get in contact with them, um, this event is hosted um, in conjunct by the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus, uh, which is chaired on the House side um, by Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. On the Senate side, the co-chairs of the caucus are Senator John Thune and. Senator Patrick Leahy, and we are really in their debt for actually supporting this forum, which seeks to only educate congressional staff about key Internet issues, and that's what we're doing today. Um, um, our moderator for today is Victoria Espinel. Um, she is the president and CEO of, of BSA, the Software Association, and um, she was the first ever, recently, she was the first ever um, U.S. intellectual property coordinator in the White House, and before that, she was with the U.S. Trade Administration, and before that, which is fitting for this particular panel, she was a professor of law at George Mason University Law School. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Victoria, and thanks so much for coming. Uh, organizing this on a really important issue. So... Um, just briefly, I'm Victoria Spinell. I'm the president and CEO of BSA, the Software Alliance. Um, we are the leading advocates for the global software industry, and I'm proud to say that our members are among the world's most innovative companies. A big part of what we spend our time doing is urging policymakers to put in place policies that will promote innovation and help shape the right policy environment um, for digital commerce. One of the issues that we face today is with the incredible explosion of the amount of data that is being generated and also the importance of data services like big data analytics, uh, data security, data storage. We need greater clarity in the rules around how law enforcement accesses data. And that's an issue here in the United States and it's an issue globally as well. Um, what we're, today we're going to be discussing the Microsoft case um, against the Department of Justice regarding U.S. law enforcement access to information that is being held overseas in Ireland. Uh, and this is a really important case where, where Microsoft and I think the software industry as a whole is raising important questions about the current practice here in the United States. But it's also an important case because the issues in that case um, have implications for our broader domestic policy here. Um, there are real international implications and, and depending upon the outcome of the case um, and what, if anything, Congress might do with the outcome of that case. And I think there's really important questions about sort of the functioning and the health of the Internet as a whole. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. I think we're going to have a good discussion about some of those issues. I think it would be great if we also, uh, if people had ideas about some potential solutions for at least part of that. Um, including um, issues that we work on, like reform of the MLAT system, pushing for international norms. Um, so uh, with that, I'm just going to, I will um, briefly introduce our panelists. We have John Frank here from Microsoft, Jennifer Daskal from American University Law School, Brian Cunningham with the Chertoff Group, and Nula O'Connor from CDT. Um, thank you all for coming. Really looking forward to the discussion. Um, and I am going to start at, at, the, at the opposite end and work this way and ask each of our panelists to speak briefly for about five minutes or so, um, and, then we'll, uh, and then we'll have some questions and I think a very interesting exchange. Um, so with that, John Frank, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm John Frank, and I lead a team of or teams of lawyers uh, responsible for our law enforcement, national security work, our cybercrime work, and uh, legal advice on cybersecurity issues at Microsoft. And we brought a lawsuit um, a little more than a year ago uh, in the Southern District of New York, arguing that a warrant issued by the Southern District 
was not valid in compelling us to provide information about a customer's communication stored in our Dublin data center. The case is a fairly simple case from a legal point of view. It's the ECBA statute, the Stored Communications Act, uh, 2701, 2, and 3, and whether or not those have extraterritorial, you know, are those worldwide statutes or are they limited to the United States? Um, and, you know, as you know, lawyers can revel in those details, but I thought it might be more interesting for me to provide a broader context for why these issues are important. Cloud computing is the new paradigm in information technology. Um, the, the economics are just super compelling. Uh, just as people used to, everybody used to have their own power plant, and we realized, well, there's, there's great economics to having centralized power plants, and people might have a backup generator, but, you know, we don't all each run our own power plants anymore. And for enterprises, the cost is lower, the security is better, the ability to keep systems up to date is better, and it opens up a whole realm of possibilities to, for small enterprises to obtain leading technology without any capital out, outlay. So you just have these compelling economic, technological advantages for moving to the cloud. And we're seeing that people want to move their data to the cloud. They want to take advantage of it. But the Stone disclosures put a very bright light on the issue of government accessing their data. And so, you know, we took some steps following the Snowden disclosures to make sure that our data in transit and in rest was not subject to unlawful snooping or, well, you know, government intercept by any means. But the lawful access issues are ones that are still very important. And as a government, of the United States, you know, how would the government of the United States feel about storing its data or having its data stored in another country? Well, you'd want to get some protections for it. And for the first 20 years of the Internet, we've had pretty much U.S. hegemony of where all the data sat. But that's breaking down because cloud computing is spreading so fast and people want the very fast service and you know, the scalability, so we're putting data centers in lots of countries now. And the question is, what are the rules in this new paradigm for when governments, for law, for law enforcement, can get access? And up until now, you know, ECPA has said that as a U.S. service provider for data stored in the U.S., we cannot provide it except with limited exceptions. And one of those exceptions is, obviously, a lawful order under 2703, um, and the other one is exigent circumstances. In other words, it, we, we have a well-founded belief it's necessary to prevent loss of human life. And so, but those kind of exceptions have applied. And up till now, when foreign governments have asked for information about, you know, a French government asked for information about a French citizen, we apply those tests and we say, well, unless you fit one of those two tests, you have to use the MLAT process the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty process. And foreign governments have sort of lived with that, but that's breaking down, and now people want, you know, governments naturally, they want to have access to data about their citizens, whether the data is stored in their country or another country. Um, and so as we work through the rules of how this system is going to work, our lawsuit shines a light on a problem that, we don't believe that the ECPA statute as drafted was intended to be a global statute uh, but apply to U.S. data. Um, and so we need a framework then to have an international system so that customers can have confidence that their data is secure and governments can have confidence that for law enforcement and, and security purposes they can obtain data in an efficient way. So that's broadly the set of issues that we're dealing with. So just to, just because, um, just to back up for a second and just to make sure that everyone in the room knows about what the Microsoft case really is, um, just in a quick nutshell, um, it's 
Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. In a, in a very quick nutshell, the Microsoft case involves um, the government serving a warrant on Microsoft for data that's located, content data that's located in a data center. In Ireland, Microsoft has argued that um, the warrant, warrant does not have extraterritorial reach, that the U.S. government should go through the MLAT process with Ireland in order to get that data. And the government has basically said, no, um, this is not an issue about extraterritorial reach because you, Microsoft, are located in the United States and therefore you're within our jurisdiction and you have control over the data so we're going to, um, so we can compel you, Microsoft, to turn over the data as a company located in the United States. Um, so I want to be clear for a second what this case is not about because I think it's been misrepresented a little bit in some of the discussions. It's not really a case about privacy. In this case, the U.S. government got a warrant. They've served a warrant on Microsoft, and nobody's claiming that anybody's potential Fourth Amendment rights or other privacy rights are being violated. What this case is really about is a case about sovereignty and a case about jurisdiction in this world where data is truly global. And it's a case about what's really kind of a new world order in which governments can compel production of data wherever it's located outside of its jurisdiction um, with neither the government agent who's seeking the data nor the company official who who's, has control over that, that data ever leaving their own territory. And so, I, I mean, my take on this is that neither side, the Microsoft's position nor the government's position, is satisfying at all. I have written separately that when you look at the statute and because our presumptions about um, against um, extraterritorial reach of statutes that I think in this particular case Microsoft should win, but I don't think that's a satisfying outcome long term. I think we really need to have a much longer term policy discussion. And similarly, if the government wins, I also don't think that's satisfying. So I'm going to brief, very briefly explain why. Um, so if Microsoft wins, it's basically an argument that data location controls. And there's two problems with this. First, it's a huge incentive for data localization. It's a huge incentive for countries to, to pass laws that say providers need to keep data within our jurisdiction. And that has huge, enormous costs for all the kinds of efficiency argument, efficiency gains of the Internet and the cloud that we just heard about a second ago. And secondly, it just doesn't make sense in a world of highly mobile data for where data is located at any given moment to be determinative of the rules that apply. Um, I'm happy to discuss this further, but I mean, there's a, a number of reasons why that's true. Data is highly mobile, um, locations unstable. Relevant data may not even be housed in a single jurisdiction. Sometimes data that's being sought is partitioned and held in multiple different jurisdictions. And unlike the situation when one buys land or makes a decision to put one's property in a particular case, often the user has no control or even knowledge of where his or her data is at any given moment. And so it's not like one is making a conscious choice to bind oneself to a particular jurisdiction. Now, obviously, that can change with different rules, but that's kind of how the world operates right now. Um, and so, as we just heard, there's good reason that governments chafe when they're trying to get their own citizens' data about a local crime that occurred in their jurisdiction, and it turns out that that citizen's data happens to be located, let's say, in the United States, and they're forced to go through the U.S. MLAT process, which takes an average of 10 months. There's a real reason why governments are chafing at, at that problem. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the problem with the result of Microsoft wins. On the other hand, the government's position is a hu represents a huge problem as well because it's really the beginning to the end of sovereign control over data. So the U.S. is saying we can get data wherever it's located. It doesn't matter because we have jurisdiction over you, U.S. providers. Other countries are saying the same thing. So the U.K. has passed a law that basically says any service provider that does business within the U.K. jurisdiction within the U.K. is subject to its jurisdiction, and the U.K. can compel the production of data wherever it's located. Um, possibly without regard to, to other privacy protections. Um, Brazil's um, toyed with a similar law, France's as well. And so this has, um, just from a U.S. perspective, this has huge problems. It means that U.S. ability to control access over data and to maintain um, some of the requirements that ECPA has crafted over the years, like a requirement of a warrant based on probable cause issued by a neutral magistrate, won't apply if other countries are kind of just just grabbing the data themselves without going through this process. Um, it also puts companies in an inevitable conflict of law with the U.S. saying, you, well, you can't turn this over without a warrant, and other countries saying, under our law, you have to turn it over. Um, it compels a potential different form of data loca localization 
where requirements are put on um, per, there are requirements within a country to to host one's own data within one's within a local provider so that the company has jurisdiction over the data and and there's a real concern about a race to the bottom where um, you know, maybe this is less of a concern when we're talking about the U.S. or the U.K. compelling production of data, but let's think about this in terms of China, Russia, or a host of, an, another, of a number of other countries, and I think there's real concern. And so I'll just end by saying whichever side wins, we need to have a discussion about what the rules ought to be going forward. And we need to ha think about new domestic standards. We need to think about new international standards. We need to start talking about ECBA reform and also MLAT reform, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about all those things more. I just wanted to pick up exactly right where the professor left off. This is uh, obviously not just a U.S. problem. It's not just a problem of American courts compelling American companies to bring data back from other countries. It's also about other countries being able to get information out of the United States when it relates to their citizens or crimes committed <clears throat> in their countries. And so while I think Congress has a really important role to play here, which I'll talk about briefly in a second, uh, I think really what has to happen is there has to be a pretty wholesale overhaul of the agreements between countries uh, in both directions. And I think there's a number of key principles that I'm not sure how this should actually come out, but should be kept in mind and focused on as, as we have that international debate. Um, <clears throat> the first one is that, uh, as has been alluded to, the health not only of the Internet and the Internet economy, but the economy of the United States and, and all major countries, all countries really, um, depends on a certain amount of legal certainty about when data can be acquired and where and under what conditions. And that just doesn't exist right now. It's sort of the Wild West, uh, and the rules vary. And the mutual legal assistance treaties – the T is plural. There's not a global agreement on how to deal with this stuff. There are many, many different treaties. They cover different types of crimes. They have different procedures. The one thing most of, or not all, if not all of them have in common is they're very cumbersome and formalistic and slow and at best 20th century, uh, maybe 19th century. I was a drug prosecutor in the Clinton administration which was a long, long time ago now. Uh, so things may have changed, but my experience is 10 months is a good, that's a fast return of data under the actual mutual, mutual legal assistance treaty process. And another problem of not having certainty and not having this process work well and efficiently is, of course, all countries try to find workarounds. So you can be sure if there is a, if there is a serious terrorism or weapons of mass destruction or cyber attack case that's happening in, in, in real time, governments are going to figure out ways to get the data, even if they don't th go through courts. Intelligence agencies have their ways, uh, and, and I don't think we want to, we want to do everything we can to discourage governments from taking those kind of rogue actions outside the legal process. And, as, as a corollary of that, you need a process that's cooperative, uh, not unilateral. So uh, we want to be able to have the certainty, but also the neutral involvement of courts and judges uh, so that um, governments don't, can't just act arbitrarily. Um, as, as the professor said, uh, it, we need to design a new regime that deters gaming the system, it deters localization of data, but it also deters countries like China or Russia or even some of our closer allies from passing laws in their country to uh, do things that we don't like with the data that's held here. Um, the, the real open question to me is if we're not going to use the location of data as the criteria for how this new order should be structured, and I agree that's got a lot of flaws to it, then what are we going to use? Are we going to use the citizenship or nationality of the individual involved? Are we going to use the nationality or citizenship of the company that holds the data? I don't think anyone's really suggested a clear, coherent, perfect answer to that question yet. Um, and then I would say the last thing is that whatever we do, uh, there has to be some provision for emergencies and exigent circumstances. And John mentioned that companies under our surveillance laws have the, the uh, right under the law and liability protection to voluntarily disclose information if they think it's an exigent circumstance, but there's no mechanism for the government to come in and compel that, depending on how this case comes out. And 
whatever the international process is that replaces the MLAT system or fixes it or improves it, it's going to take a very long time to negotiate. So one of the things I would recommend to the, the administration is as they work on this, don't start out trying to get a global single mutual legal assistance treaty. Pick some of the countries that are closest to us in terms of our, ally, our allies and also are, are technologically similar to where we are and try to work out agreements with them that can serve as models for, for going forward in the future. Just do these things one at a time or a couple at a time. The last thing I would say, uh, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> is um, – uh, my, my law partners run a congressional investigations defense practice. So the last thing I ever want to do is come down here and suggest there should be a hearing. But there should be a hearing. Uh, everyone agrees there's a problem with the MLAT system, but at least as far as I know, there's very little empirical data that's publicly available about how bad it is. Ten months is the average number that you hear thrown around, but we don't know if it's, at least I don't know, but it's not publicly known, how many cases are, uh, that are hung up and, and backlogged are terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, cybersecurity, even, you know, a so-called garden variety homicide. Obviously, that's a horrible tragedy for the people involved. But as a country, we might, we might be less concerned about slow evidence gathering in those kind of situations than, you know, real serious threats to national security. Um, which countries are, are there any countries where the system's working relatively well and can we learn any lessons from that? How badly broken is the technology that the U.S. government uses to exchange information with other countries? So there's just a whole host of data that just isn't in the public domain. So I would suggest Congress have a hearing on it. Thanks. What a terrible idea. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you to Victoria for letting me go last. I'm Nula O'Connor. I'm the president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology. And I can dispense with some of the legal analysis. I commend you to our website and our amicus filings in these in the various rounds of this case. We think Microsoft is largely right on the law under ECPA and the, the Stored Communications Act. Um, but I do, and I agree with much of what Professor Daskal said, uh, especially about the need to forge new paradigms around very much the structure of the Internet and the data flows and how we have legal structures that support and really promote the rights and the dignity of the individual and their expectations of privacy. But I will disagree with the, th the, th the thought that it's not about privacy because I think it fundamentally, this case, will affect how we relate to our own data online and our expectations of privacy and the security and who has access to that data and what intrusions are on that data. And having been a chief privacy officer of several major companies, not Microsoft, although it was actually Amazon with a big cloud company, I was just reminded yesterday by Facebook Messenger from a cousin in Europe that I'd made a terrible mistake leaving Amazon since the stock went up, what, 15 percent yesterday, and wouldn't I have been in a better place today? But in any case, we do this job for love, not money. Um, and uh, having also served at the Department of Homeland Security, you should all be much more concerned about the government getting your data. Let me just say, having worked in both of the corporate and in the government, the potential for intrusion and misuse of your data by federal actors, not only in this country but in other parts of the world, should keep you awake at night. It certainly does me. Because what can the government do to you once they have your data and misuse it? Well, I leave that to further discussion. But um, we are obviously concerned about misuse and, and uh, use and collection of data by commercial and, and government actors. But what we're working on at CDT is really the const uh, working towards a new construct of privacy, of dignity, online, the digital self, one's data as an extension of one's self. And I agree that I don't think the Europeans or the Americans have the right paradigm yet, and we are so far off the playing field of the global dialogue around personal information on the Internet. I just sat with a member of Parliament yesterday, uh, and uh, sorry, a member of the, the European Parliament, and she said, but you Americans, you take all our data. You All your companies just take all our data all the time. And so it does get to the issue of terms of service and expectations of the individual and where they live and, and some of the things Brian talked about. What's the right setup from the beginning about what I expect a company or a government to be able to do or access my data? I think Professor Daskal has actually written something about the terms of service and that at least it is aligned with expectations in this case. I 
think that's the conversation good companies are having online already. Governments are starting to have. I am weary of the argument that the MLAT process is too slow. That so so fix it. Like I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you my data. Just I'm looking at you, Brian, as if you're the, the spokesperson of that. I shouldn't. Um, but the answer is not. We'll do away with process and have unfettered access to data online. When we are living our lives, I get up in the morning and the first thing I do is check this phone. And I'll bet if I, if we polled you, most of you would say the same thing. I email my my kids' school or work or friends or whatever. My entire life trans is transacted through my online identity. There should not simply be unfettered access and without very strong controls and expectations, again, that I have boundaries around my data and that I have an expectation and that I know what law applies, that I know what I have chosen to do when I have signed up for a particular service online. So... What else? What else can I say? I've done pretty well in three and a half minutes. I do think there should be a higher barrier for, for government access to data. I think that there are creative solutions on the table, and good thinkers in Washington and around the world are thinking about streamlining the process. But at the end of the day, we believe in more the Latin American construct of habeas data, my data myself, that I have boundaries and I have ongoing rights and, and access to that data. I may choose to give it freely to companies that I do business with online. I believe the government has a right to some data for legitimate law enforcement and legal processes and other government operations. But at the end of the day, the data is a part of me and should be treated as such. Thank you. Um, so thank you. That was great. Um, I will say on, on the, you know, the first thing you reach for in the morning is your phone. I suspect you're right on that poll. I, I would say, you know, take it one step further. The first thing I do when I wake up in the middle of the night is reach for that phone. So right. um, it is it is the phone and kind of the, the, data the fact that that has become the, the diary of our minds in a really powerful way that is very different from any kind of technology that we've had before, I think has enormous implications. But so I, I feel like we've already touched on lots of issues. We've talked about conflict of law that I would like to come back to, conflicts of law. Um, our panelists touched a little bit on sort of the international precedent of these issues and what the implications are for what happens here in the United States overseas. Talked a little bit about the MLATs. Um, I would like to come back to all of those, but I'm going to start with a question sort of keying off um, uh, my seatmate here. So, you know, as we, you know, I think this case and the facts of this case, um, it is true as Professor Daskal said, this is not a case that, that tackles every issue out there. But I, what I think the Microsoft case is, is a very, is a specific and an important example of the kind of problems that we are going to be, that we do face and we're going to be facing more and more around the world as the amount of data that individuals and companies create continues to increase and as that is stored around the world. And, and the law enforcement will, of course, and importantly, want access to that data so that they can accomplish the mission that they have to protect the, the safety and security of citizens around the world. So, you know, I think there is a, there's a broader policy debate um, that this case, I think, is, a, is sort of an entryway to in terms of how you balance or find the right balance between public safety and the important, the incredibly important need for public safety and privacy, free expression, uh, due process, overall network security. There are lots of bigger, or there are lots of policy issues that are implicated by this case. But I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with the privacy and, and kick it back to that. And I would welcome thoughts from Nuala and from others on how do we do that? You know, we talk a lot when we're talking about government surveillance or warrants or the Microsoft case about how do we find that right balance between the need for public safety and the need to make sure that there are sufficient protections for privacy and that citizens of the world both know and feel comfortable about how their data is being treated and protected. So I'm going to kick that off to you, but then would welcome comments from other panelists as well. So I think the first point we would make is we, can't, we, we think of the Internet as a global resource, right? That this, yes, we get lots of credit for having started it here and lots of great American companies, but at the end of the day, we think about it as an issue of human rights, of individual liberty for citizens all around the world. So whatever we say is the right deal for us is going to be the right deal for the Chinese government or the Russian government or the French citizen or whomever. It reminds me of the worst examples of law school exam questions, right? You're, you're, you're a French citizen. You're transacting with a U.S. company based in California. The product they're sending you is made in Japan. It's going through servers in Singapore. And it, the, the thing is being delivered by, you know, a German delivery company. I mean, how many more company, countries are going to touch this data in order to serve you the book or the sweater or whatever you just bought online? Um, I think the first 
and again, we look at it as a very human-centric question. So what does the individual know? What is their expectation? How do we get their paradigm, kind of their rights as close to home? And I would probably drive a little bit off geographic location as the first line, but terms of well-disclosed terms of service could be another paradigm. Um, and yes, let me, I mean, I sound a little bit like a, you know, I'm, I'm calling for the end of federal government. That's not at all true. Again, I believe in this country and keeping our children safe and, and the rest of the world as well. Um, but I do believe at the end of the day, the data dignity issue is one that I'm very concerned about and that it is, again, fundamentally our data with which to transact and engage and that the intrusions by governments should be extremely limited, extremely targeted based on a narrow predicate, based on an actual ongoing investigation. Um, don't get me started on bulk data collection and, you know, sort of surveillance in the end, but there, there is no evidence that it works and also that it's, you know, it's certainly healthy for society as a whole. Um, I am mindful, however, though, of the argument that, um, these kinds of initiatives could end up with fragmentation of the internet, and that would be equally harmful to the self as speaker, as as uh, issues of free expression, of global collaboration. So we need to be very mindful of those values as well. First of all, I just want to revise and extend my earlier remarks and make it clear that I'm not the unfettered access guy. I know, I know. Sorry. <laughs> the second thing I would say is I think there's already – uh, a, a very good news story that's coming in part out of the Microsoft case, and that is there's a – I won't go into the boring details, but there's a quirk in American uh, electronic surveillance law that goes back to the 80s, I guess, that if you have the content of an email that has been stored for less than 180 days – it's it's more difficult. You have to have a, a stronger warrant to get that than if it's 181 days or older. That just makes no sense at all. It probably didn't even make sense in the 80s. It certainly doesn't make sense now. And I think there's very, very strong support on the Hill, on both sides of the aisle, and among a lot of people that you would think of as national security hawks, the unfettered access guys, uh, who who believe it's time that we we fix that law and make it make it – the rule in the United States that if anyone's content, whether it's in an email or a text message, whether it's streaming live or it's been stored for X number of days or Y number of days, you got to get a warrant. So I think that's going to happen, and I think that's going to be a very uh, positive outgrowth from the standpoint of privacy. On the more international part of this, I think one thing that's going to be really important from a privacy and human rights standpoint is – as we go through this process of revising these agreements uh, around the world with, with various countries, that the United States take a really firm stand that whatever the data access regime is, it only applies between individual countries to laws that each country agrees are valid laws. And the MLAT system has that already. So, for example, uh, our agreement with Mexico allows Mexico to refuse to send defendants back to the United States if there's a chance that we're going to impose the death penalty. And there's, there's a lot in these treaties that specify which kind of crimes uh, data and people can be exported back under. So I think we, we want to just make sure that, you know, if we sign an agreement with the Chinese, we don't agree that they can get data still in the United States about their citizens for purposes of persecuting the Falun Gong or whatever. So I think there's opportunities to actually make the international regime more privacy and human rights friendly as well as more efficient and more able to uh, get the countries what they legitimately need. Great. So thanks. So first I just, I just want to completely endorse that point about the, the hopeful future in which it's clear either by, by Supreme Court ruling or by congressional amendment to ECPA that all content requires a warrant um, when, when the government's seeking content for law enforcement purposes. Secondly, I want to clarify something I said. I, don't, I did not mean to suggest that this case doesn't have privacy implications. I think it has enormous privacy implications. I just don't think in this particular case privacy is the issue. In the case, the government got a warrant based on probable cause that a crime was being committed, and nobody suggests that the individual, whoever the individual target of this investigation, um, that there has been a violation of his or her privacy in this particular case. But I agree it has enormous privacy implications, which is one of the reasons why it's such an interesting case, not to think about the specifics of the case, but kind of what flows from it. And with that in mind, I'm not sure the privacy implications are, are straightforward. Again, um, if, you know, the, what, if the government 
if, if, the, if Microsoft wins, that means, that essentially means that um, other countries get to set to make the determination as to when and under what conditions data is turned over. And that's not necessarily a net positive for privacy rights and human rights going forward. There are the, the U.S. warrant system requiring law enforcement to get data based on probable cause pursuant to review by a neutral magistrate is kind of the gold standard in the world. And if we start saying that other countries get to make those determinations, that has, that's, there's real sovereignty and democracy values to that, but it's not necessarily a net gain for privacy. So I think this stuff becomes very complicated, very, very very quickly. And then I just want to touch on one other thing that we haven't brought up, which is um, this case is all about content and about the, what happens when a government is trying to get access to content. There's another thing that's going on right now, which is there are no, there's no requirement under U.S. law that the government get a warrant in order to get metadata. So things like subscriber information about the amount of time that you've been logged on, where your IP address, all that information, potentially credit card information if it's relevant, all that information can get, can be obtained without a warrant. And and that also means that foreign governments can get that information without going through the MLAT process. And there's no clear standards under U.S. law or in international agreements about when and under what conditions companies turn over that data. And I really think when we're starting to talk about privacy more broadly, we need to focus on that issue as well. As a, as a company, our relationship with our customers fundamentally changes from going to providing you technology to now we're holding your data. And we kind of view it as, you know, we think about how banks hold your money. If you've got a trust that that bank is going to keep your money, um, or, you know, you've got insurance, whatever, you've got to know you're not going to lose your money. And, and so for us, we do have a recognition that trust has got to be a cornerstone of our technology. And as a, you know, so being an advocate for the privacy of our customers within agreed upon legal rules becomes really important how we think about our business. And so for us, this, this case is an example of where we are trying to advocate for our customers. Now, I, I don't disagree that the U.S. legal system has great virtues, but I don't feel imperialistic about imposing a Fourth Amendment standard on Ireland. And so, you know, the, the argument that the Department of Justice makes is that 2703 applies internationally. And, and, but 2703 is an exception to 2702, which, which requires us limits who can make disclosures to. So it would require them to say that we can't make a disclosure to the Irish government in response to an Irish search warrant approved by an Irish judge about an Irish citizen. And that's a pretty significant intrusion on the sovereignty of Ireland when the data center is sitting in Ireland. And you know, every country's got different sets of rules, and to some extent we have to sort of accept that, well, you know, for an Irish person, they're a democracy. They get to participate in making their own rules. And one of the biggest problems we have with MLAT, in fact, is we, we try to impose our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, which to American lawyers after years of study makes sense. <laughs> but but to, the, you know, to the Brazilian government, they, they never seem to be able to satisfy because they don't understand it. So you know, we have to understand that, you know, that extending American sovereignty into every situation, while intellectually we can see the virtues of it, may not make practical sense. And we're going to need to figure out an overall system. And I, I completely agree. This, this case does not solve every problem. In fact, it probably speeds up the need for a solution, which I think is a positive thing. But I'll, I'll concede. I, I don't think that we're solving a lot of problems with the case by itself. Great. So I, actually, I want to pick up on that, that sort of concept of American sovereignty. And Professor Daskal, you've raised the fact that there are different standards. There could be conflicts of law that come out of this case. And in some cases, there's no clear standard. Um, you know, that I think is, is true. I think it's also true that while we're having this debate here in the United States, many governments around the world are struggling with exactly the same question about how to balance those things. And, then, and we've talked, we've touched on, I think, slightly some of the sort of 
pros and cons of the American model. So I want to take that one step further and just ask um, you all, do you think it is, is it helpful for the U.S., the administration at this point, to be actively working with other countries to try to come to some sort of common understanding? Is that a helpful thing? Is it not helpful? Is it essential? Um, and, and then I'd be interested in your views on that, and then depending upon the answer, I'd also really be interested in views on the best way to take that forward. That's not, that's not an easy conversation to have. So um, maybe I'll start with you since you've touched on some of these issues before, but again, would be interested in getting views from the whole panel. So, so yes, I think it's helpful. Yes, I also think it's essential. I mean, I think that you can't, it's one of the biggest um, problems. So, so just to step back a second. So when I talked about the fact that the U.S., um, that, that a system in which Microsoft won and the privacy interests um, are, are, are determined by another state's laws as being potentially less protective. Um, and there's also privacy interests, as, as we said, on the other side as well. And so um, it's one of the concerns on, on the sovereignty issue is that um, it's, the, it's a unilateral decision by the U.S. government at this point in the Microsoft case to say, I can step into Ireland and I can take this data without your consent. And it creates this huge potential problem, as I said before, with other countries doing that with respect to U.S. data and U.S. person data. And so one step number one is just beginning to have a dialogue and come together and start coming up with, cert with rules that make sense in which um, democracies and other governments get to set privacy protections for their own citizens to some extent. But there's also a recognition of the fact that um, we need to rethink how this all works because um, we're, we're, we're completely, our data is completely interconnected. And so we need to have new rules that both respect sovereignty and also respect the need to access data in a, in a truly interconnected world. Great. Thank you. We should also be mindful of the fact that if we have this privity where other countries can come to us, the majority, the, the vast majority of data is still coming, is situated in or coming through the United States. And the, the burden on the companies, not to speak for the companies here, but when the company and the individual interests align, that's not a bad thing, will be very, very significant. But you're absolutely right. The goal, first of all, we've used that very phrase, the gold standard. I don't know where it's come, but we, we agree certainly that it's the gold standard. But it's also incredibly kind of imperialist of us to say everybody else should do it exactly the same way we should, right? And I, I, I note with irony, this is an Irish case. If anyone hasn't figured out from my hair or my name where I was born, um, that I feel a little passionately about everything and this in particular, um, we, we do have to be mindful that everybody else feels the same way about their country that we feel about ours, right? And so the dialogue has to be a global one. And we have been, we've been damaged by the Snowden revelations. You cannot but admit that the conversation globally around data, around law enforcement and national security has, has taken a, 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 a very difficult turn for us as a country. And that is not to say that there aren't a lot of other countries who are, are doing a lot of the same things, but our revelations have put our systems on the kind of uh, front burner for scrutiny. And so it's been a very difficult international dialogue, but that's not to say we shouldn't try to continue. As I said before, I think... The administration absolutely should be having dialogue and negotiations with other countries about reforming the MLAT system. I'm highly skeptical of trying to forge some sort of global agreement in anything like a timely fashion. But we can be talking to the British and the French and the Germans, and there's multiple layers to this problem. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that has to do with technology and connectivity. I mean. These, my understanding is a lot of these requests are literally snail mailed from government to government. And then there's this sort of convoluted system where each government creates a department or agency that's the receiving end of those requests, but it's often not the law enforcement people. So now it sits in somebody's inbox for a while at that department. There's all kinds of issues like that, having better auditing and tracking of, and transparency about what data is being exchanged and how long it takes that we could be negotiating right now and not touch, not not touch, not condition progress on those areas on solving all the thornier problems, which are going to be really difficult. And I think probably the most difficult one is this notion that under our system, under the gold standard, uh, there has to be a neutral and detached magistrate that decides to issue a warrant that, that, that is not part of the executive branch of the country. We're not unique in that, but there's a lot of countries that don't have it. 
And this creates a huge problem for the countries that don't have a neutral detached magistrate who come before U.S. courts or our Justice Department takes the position, well, you don't do it this way, so you can't meet our Fourth Amendment standards, so you're not going to get the data. I will say, though, that I think we are uh, in the process of exporting the gold standard. There was a U.K. Supreme Court decision just in the last week that said that one of the electronic surveillance regimes in the U.K. is, uh, they wouldn't use the word unconstitutional, but inconsistent with, the, I think, the Treaty on Human Rights in Europe, precisely because the orders are approved by an executive branch official and there is no neutral and detached magistrate so Britain's going to have to face that. There's also a study out by a, a really good privacy institute in Amsterdam uh, out this week. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but I think what it does is it surveys a lot of the laws and the actual operations of, of, of intelligence and law enforcement agencies in European countries and concludes that I think every single one of them, or almost every single one, should have a neutral and detached decision maker in the process. So. I'm not as hopeless as some people are that we can uh, successfully export the gold standard, even though it is imperialistic to want to. <laughs> I, I think the, uh, there's actually relatively simple solutions to some of the problems, not all the problems, and some of them will get very complicated. And so I, I, I'm sort of in favor of, like, just be pragmatic and solve some of the easy ones first and then work up on the more difficult ones. But I think if, you know, uh, any four of you could sit down and play the game theory out. One of you represents the government of a country. The other represents a customer in the country, uh, country A, and somebody else, country B, and customer in country B, and talk about a reciprocal relationship of when can government access data stored in the other country. Um, and some of those principles, you know, I think most people would agree that we don't, we don't have a strong an interest in protecting, you know, requiring a Fourth Amendment standard when an Irish court has issued a search warrant for an Irish person. Um, similarly, Ireland doesn't have a strong interest, you know, when a federal judge has issued a search warrant on a U.S. person. And we can probably both get comfortable with that. Um, and so it does move us more towards the personhood of, of the individual, you know, where, where the person is. And we do that today by IP lookups, and, you know, we kind of make sure that the person is in the country there the government's asking for data on. Um, but I think you can, you can take steps that way. And, you know, the LEADS Act is, is something that I think provides a step towards a solution. It's not a complete solution, but it's, again, recognizing that the U.S. should have an interest in be able to get data about U.S. persons, even when it's stored outside the U.S. Um, and so I think that there is the possibility. I think governments are interested in, in having a solution. I think the administration, some people have, have recognized that with more and more data centers going up around the world, the U.S. monopoly on data centers is going away and that the U.S. is going to need to have something in place for the future. Great. Thanks. Um, I just want – this is – I want to, since we're up here for the Congressional Internet Caucus, I guess I want to make a pitch sort of building on some things that have been said by the panelists for something that Congress could do, which is certainly will not be the whole solution, but would be a really helpful piece of the puzzle, which is helping to modernize the MLAT system. I think that would be really helpful. We, as the Software Alliance, have been up advocating, you know, both for DOJ to have more resources. Um, the situation has not changed. There is a significant backlog at DOJ, which is difficult for them to deal with with the resources they have. And the process overall could be streamlined and modernized, and we believe also made more transparent. So we would, we would encourage and urge Congress to be looking at that as something that is practical, um, that could be done relatively easily, and I think would be really helpful in terms of, of part of the solution. Um, so I want to leave a little bit of time for our for questions from the audience. Um, uh, I assume there is there a mic somewhere available in the room. Um, if there are questions, uh, if you would identify who you are and where you come from uh, as part of your question, that would be great. All right.
Sure. So on your on your first question, and I, I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I do have an answer of what I think doesn't work. I don't think making location of the data determinative is a good solution precisely because of that problem. Now, figuring out what's the best answer for what should replace it is hard. I mean, one option, one option is personhood. So one option is the citizen, um, the nationality of the data user. That's one option. Another option is um, the, the place where the company's headquartered. So um, if, if Microsoft is headquartered in the United States, then the United States has jurisdiction over Microsoft and also over the data in Microsoft's jurisdiction, similarly with Google. That's another option. One um, might be the location of the user, but again, users are mobile as well. So it's figuring out what the right answer is is really hard. All of them have some features. All of them have some bugs as well. Um, and so um, that's, that's kind of the million-dollar question, but I think um, – Data locate da data lo the place of where data happens to be located is probably one of the worst options. I'm not sure which aspects of the NPT you're suggesting might be a model. I would say one one hybrid between, as I understand it, how the non-proliferation treaty has worked and how some other agreements have worked is you could have a situation where the U.S. reaches an agreement with Canada or U.K. or whatever. And you basically then open up that treaty for other countries to become signatories to it when they're ready and when they're willing to agree to the terms. And I, that's, I think that's a little bit how some of the other international agreements work. The problem with that is, or one problem with it is, that, again, the, as I understand it, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty system has always had a component that requires the countries agreeing to agree on specific laws that they will and will not allow data to be exchanged uh, under the treaty. So, it, you know, the Brit Brit Britain and Germany aren't going to have the same list of laws probably. So I'm, I'm, I'm still, again, skeptical about whether you could ultimately have a single treaty. One, one thing I wanted to come back to um, and, and repeat my suggestion that whether it's in conjunction with the pending Leeds Act or, or independently, Congress should hold some factual hearings on this topic. One of the data points that I think is most important, and at least I haven't seen anything published that answers this question, and I won't put John on, on the spot and ask him uh, what Microsoft's experience is, but how much of, how many of the, the MLAT requests, especially the backlogged ones, are exclusively about the citizen of the country who's asking? Because certainly when we were doing drug cases, in the old days, sometimes if we wanted to get data back from Colombia, it would be about a Colombian citizen. Sometimes it would be about a U.S. citizen. Sometimes there would be 30 people of all citizenship. So whether or not the citizenship of the, of the individual is a, a viable factor in determining location and jurisdiction, in, to my mind, in part depends on how much of the problem would that really solve, and I just don't know the answer to that.